Good morning and welcome to the December LEA Special Education Point of Contact monthly training webinar. My name is Annette Thacker Bartlett and I will be your sole presenter today. I'm flying solo today with all of my other colleagues out on other duties or out of the office. I will be doing my best to answer your questions as we go along. Because there's just one of me, it may take me extra time to get to your questions. And if I am not able to answer your questions during the webinar, myself or one of my colleagues will follow up with you after the webinar. Today's webinar will be recorded and posted by early next week on the same website where all of our, our monthly trainings are recorded. During today's webinar, we are first going to talk for a few minutes about the new secondary transition monitoring approach for this school year. And then I'm going to do reminders and announcements, which I typically save for the end, but I'm going to do those at the beginning today. Because then at the end of the webinar, I'm going to spend a remaining time doing an overview of Section 504 for students with disabilities. If you have previously participated in a Section 504 overview webinar training recently, sometime this school year, given by my colleague, Ms. Angela Awanike. If you have participated in that, you will find that the content during the second half of today's webinar will be a repeat, and so you can log off early if you so desire. That is why I'm putting the announcements and reminders before the main training section of today's webinar. Secondary Transition Planning and Technical Assistance. I'm going to review with you the plan for this school year that was just recently approved by the U.S. Department of Education. And what this plan involves is regards to some mandatory training sessions coming up, as well as what monitoring will look like this school year and any other obligations. For those of you who work in an LEA that serves students who are 13 years of age or older, this is directly applicable to you. If you work in an LEA that does not serve 13 year olds or older, if you only serve those elementary age or early childhood age students, please bear with me for a few minutes during this section as it is not directly applicable to you at this time. Um, two weeks ago, Every LEA that serves students ages 13 and older received a letter. It was sent directly to the LEA leader. Um, it was specifically sent on November 29th, which informed the LEA leader of the new secondary transition monitoring plan for this year and how it is a little bit different from past years, but also still similar in some ways, as well as instructions on how to sign up for a mandatory technical assistance session. Now, I am sharing this information with you today because even though you may not be the head of the LEA and you may not have been the person that received this letter directly, this probably does apply directly to you and you might be the one that gets sent to this training. You might be the one that's heavily involved in any monitoring activities if your LEA is part of the monitoring cycle for this year. So I'm taking a few minutes today to review the contents of what that letter said so that you are fully aware of that. Now these slides here just summarize what was said in the letter. As you know, secondary transition planning requirements right now apply to students ages 16 and older. That will change to age 14 because of a law that was passed a few years ago but has not yet gone into effect. Aussie fully expects that the new age for secondary transition planning, age 14, Aussie fully expects that this will go into effect this coming July. So that is another reason why we are um, doing this a new, uh, this uh, secondary transition technical assistance series coming up in January that I will tell you about on the next slide. As you know, for several years, Aussie has been under special conditions, meaning that we have to do extra compliance reviews and reporting to the U.S. Department of Education because we've historically had very low compliance numbers for secondary transition planning requirements for students with disabilities. Over the, in the la for the last several years, your LEA may have been part of secondary transition monitoring where 
which is where Aussie has three times a year has to randomly select 100 student files from across all LEAs that have transition age students. Um, we've done that in the past. This year we are continuing to still have to do file reviews, but this year Aussie is going to focus on cohorts of LEAs. So it's not a random sampling across all LEAs, but it's designated LEAs that will be part of the file reviews this year. You've been put into different cohort years. And, in, and I will show you the letter, um, which LEAs are in which cohorts, so you can see if you will be part of the monitoring, part of the file review this year, or if you are put off for another year or two. In addition to that, all LEAs that serve age, students ages 13 and older, regardless of whether or not you are being monitored this year, all LEAs have to develop a secondary transition plan that will be implemented over the next three years. So uh, Aussie is requiring LEAs to do some long-term planning. Um, but with this requirement, Aussie is providing technical assistance sessions to assist you in developing this plan according to the laws and the best practices. <clears throat> so let me um, hear a little more information pulled from the letter that was sent to LEA leaders. One of the reasons why we're changing our approach this year is to reduce the reporting burden and to reduce the burden on LEAs of having to be potentially monitored each and every year. Now you will know for sure whether or not you will be part of the monitoring cycle for that particular year when it comes to random sampling file reviews. Here on the screen, I have put a picture of the table pulled from the letter that shows the LEAs that have been selected for this year. And in fact, let me pull up the actual letter. There's actually three different versions of the letter. One version was sent to adult LEAs. One version was sent to LEAs who will be monitored during this year's cycle. And another version, a third version of the letter was sent to LEAs who are not adult LEAs and who are not being monitored this year, but who still serve age 13 and up. So they're still part of having to do their a, a secondary transition three-year plan, but not, not part of the monitoring. So the letter looks a little different depending on what situation you're in, but the letter has this introduction language that I summarized for you in the slides. It just gives more background information about how Aussie has has to report to the U.S. Department of Ed three times a year on our compliance numbers. And of course, right now, the requirement is age 16 and up. So that is what we monitor on and that is what we report on. But when the law changes to age 14 and up, that is what we're trying to prepare you in advance for. And here in the letter, <clears throat> you can see the cohort year one. If you are in cohort year one, this means that in addition to going to the universal technical assistance session that everyone will be required to go to, you will also have to go to a second session here at Aussie where we will be doing data file reviews side by side with you and giving you a lot more hands-on assistance in writing your three-year plan. So hopefully you've been notified by now. Several of you that are here on the webinar today, I know you have seen this letter from your LEA leader because I have seen that you have registered for the upcoming technical assistance sessions in January. So thank you for taking prompt action on that. If you are listening to this webinar today and you are part of an LEA that serves students ages 13 and older and you have not seen a copy of the letter sent to your LEA leader, please reach out to your LEA leader or you can reach out to Aussie and I'll provide contact information for that. If you're wondering about about this letter. So cohort one, cohort two, and I'll scroll down. You can see here cohort three. So hopefully you've identified which cohort your LEA is in. And I'm not going to read this entire letter, but as, as a summary, it's talking about universal technical assistance for all LEAs. So every LEA who serves students 13 years of age and older must attend one half day session at Aussie in the month of January. 
actually there's one date available in February. Most of the dates are available in January. And the people that need to come to this are a small team from the LEA. So there's at least two spots reserved for each LEA. If you want to send more than two people, it's on a first come first serve basis, depending on availability. But there definitely is enough room for at least two people from each LEA to come. Preferably the special ed coordinator or perhaps you as the LEA SPED POC, or perhaps your LEA might have a designated leader that oversees secondary transition planning. Whoever the person is, is probably the ideal person to send along with another staff member, preferably someone from the leadership team that can make decisions and that could, would be a good person to help make your three-year plan. So the link is here. The link is also found in the letter. And it was also published in the LA Look Forward for these transition planning technical assistance sessions. These are the universal sessions. Then there is a second session only for those in cohort one. Again, if you are a cohort one LEA, you are listed here on this screen and you should have been notified already. And you, are, you will be receiving a second session that is targeted technical assistance where we go more in depth and we actually do some file reviews together with you. We have structured it so that you could attend the universal session in the morning from 9 a.m. to noon and then stay at Aussie for the afternoon to attend a targeted technical assistance session if you are in cohort one. Then you only have to come to Aussie for one day and you can get both sessions in one day. So we structured it that way. But if you need to come in the morning on one day and the afternoon on a different day, you can also arrange that. All of those options are available through Eventbrite. I will note that the January 16th date is reserved only for DCPS central office staff who are with the secondary transition central office team or the central office non-public monitoring team. All the other dates are open and on a first come first serve basis to all LEAs who serve students 13 years of age and older. So again, we appreciate you signing up for these sessions in a timely manner and our IDEA monitoring team will be following up with your LEA um, if you are not signed up by the end of next week to request that you do so. And if you have questions about this, you will contact Karen Morgan Donaldson, who is the director over the IDEA monitoring and compliance team for LEAs here at Aussie. Let me just put her email into the chat box. So that's Karen Morgan hyphen Donaldson at dc.gov. I put her email into the chat box. If you have questions about the letter that your LEA received, if you have questions about secondary transition monitoring, please contact her. Okay, moving on to the reminders and announcements for about 10 minutes, and then we will spend the last half of the webinar talking about Section 504. So reminders and announcements, I will, we have uh, recently still been getting a lot of tickets in the Aussie support tool regarding SEDS access. In particular, issues around non-publics, non-public staff being able to access students within SEDS or even get access to SEDS in general. So I'm going to provide a couple of resources here to direct your attention to as well as a couple tips for your role in ensuring SEDS access is smooth for not just your staff, but for non-public staff who serve your students from your LEA. And then I'm gonna provide a few reminders about upcoming deadlines for child outcome summary, as well as upcoming professional development opportunities. In October, Aussie provided a live training demonstration through a webinar of how a related service provider does their specific tasks within SEDS. All of you in your role as the LEA SCPOC have the responsibility to oversee what related service providers are doing 
and in particular what they're doing in SEDS, how they're documenting the services that they provide. And it's up to you to ensure that those service providers know how to correctly log a service, how to correctly generate a service tracker, and how to correctly contribute to a progress report, as those three actions are required by related service providers. So we have a recorded webinar video that you can pass along to any of your related service providers who seem to be struggling or who might be newer to using SEDS to do these things. In addition to the video, if they don't want to sit and watch a video, if they're more of a um, like visual learner, we have a step-by-step -step visual guide. It's a PDF document with pictures and instructions step-by-step -step on how to create a service log both for a delivered service session and for a missed service session. A lot of, in a lot of cases, service providers are not aware they need to create a log when a session was scheduled to have occurred but was missed for various reasons. Those logs also need to be created. And how to generate a service tracker, which is a different task in SEDS than generating a service log. And it also provides step-by-step -step instructions on how a related service provider goes about getting access to sets. And of course, don't forget about our 200 page step-by-step -step with pictures user guide for SEDS. It does cover every part of SEDS. That is a helpful resource. All of these can be found on one convenient location on the Aussie website here. So please take this resource and pass it along, not just to the service providers at your LDA, but to service providers who serve your students at other locations, such as non-public campuses. Speaking of non-publics, I have here listed first those related service provider resources that were on the previous slide that, that you can share with non-publics. And in addition, we recently had another webinar at Aussie that went into great detail and did a live demonstration of how non-public staff can use two required database systems that are specific to non-publics. You may have never heard of these systems or you may have heard of them, but you yourself do not use them on a day-to-day -day basis because they are only for non-public programs. That is the Squire database and the Seats database. One is for managing student attendance at non-publics, which is critical to, to track that for payment reasons and also to ensure the students are receiving FAPE. And the other database, the Squire, is about keeping track of program and staff information for non-public staff. So both of those are required database systems that non-publics have to use. So it might be helpful for you to pass along this resource to them in case they missed the webinar we gave on this last month. The Aussie non-public monitoring team does communicate directly with all non-publics about these resources. So hopefully they've already heard about them. We did have over 80 non-publics participate recently in some of these webinar trainings, which is great. Um, but we wanna make you aware of these resources so you can share them along. And now for SEDS access, I want to remind you the appropriate way that you provide SEDS access to your staff. So let's first talk about LEA staff, and then separately I'm going to talk about non-public staff and how, your role in, in getting them access. This is not any new information. Nothing, there's nothing new about this. This has been the, this has been the protocol for several years now. For some of you that are experienced LEA SEPOCs, you already know all this information and you are great about staying on top of access issues. You've been great about doing your housekeeping and inactivating staff who have left your LEA or who have left the non-public so that they do not still have access to sensitive student records. Thank you for that. For those of you that are newer to being the LEA SEPOC, we encourage you to really pay attention here and follow the proper protocol when it comes to granting access to staff. If you have a new staff member at your, at your LEA, at one of your school campuses or at your central office, whether it's a teacher, a service provider, a supervisor, if they work for the LEA, then they come to you and you actually create them a SEDS account using their name and, your, and their LEA official email address. You as the LEA SEPOC, it's in your hands to determine the level of access they have within SEDS. Different user types on a person's profile in SEDS 
give them different levels of access to being able to do certain tasks within SEDS. So whenever you set up a SEDS account for somebody, please think carefully about the level of access and the types of tasks they need to be doing in SEDS and select the correct user profile. You also further determine access to specific students by managing their caseload. Or you can delegate this to the special education coordinator or other staff who have the ability to manage caseloads within SEDS. I know all of you are very busy and you can't always be in the weeds in the details of managing caseloads. So for some of you, this is something you've delegated to other staff. And of course, you also need to provide training. If you're giving staff access to SEDS, you need to give them the support to be able to use SEDS. Um, the resources I mentioned in a previous slide for related service providers, that's a great place to start to making sure that your new staff know how to correctly log a service if they are a service provider. And of course, communicating any policies or procedures that have to do specifically with your LEA. Now let's talk about SEDS access for non-public staff. This is more complicated. It's not as straightforward as SEDS access for LEA staff. For a non-public staff to access SEDS, it takes three key players. It takes the non-public SEDS point of contact, it takes you as the LEA SEPOC, and it takes the Aussie help desk staff. So there's three key players involved. Each non-public should have a SEDS point of contact. That person is responsible to coordinate SEDS access for non-public staff. They themselves do not have the ability to create SEDS accounts. They do not have that ability. They, but they are the one responsible for coordinating and communicating with you and communicating with Aussie to get their staff the access that they need. And they are responsible for training their staff on how to appropriately use SEDS. You as the LEA SEPOC, you oversee SEDS, SEDS access for all of your users, not just the staff at your LEA, but also for non-public users who serve students from your LEA. Now, you are not creating SEDS accounts for a non-public staff person. You do not create the account, but you do control the level of access that they have to your students and to your LEA within SEDS. The Aussie Help Desk staff, they play a role in setting up the aggregate account, which I will discuss on the next slide. So only you and only the non-public SEDS point of contact are the ones who are responsible for liaisoning with Aussie to troubleshoot any issues. Um, we often get phone calls from random people. Just this morning, I got an email from a random person at an elementary school campus from an LEA looking for SEDS help and SEDS training. And so I responded to redirecting them to contact their LEA SEPOC. So it's only you and your role when you come to Aussie to get support if you're not able to solve the access issues on your own. And the non-public SEDS POC also comes to Aussie to resolve issues for SEDS accounts and to request SEDS accounts for non-public staff. So let's say you have a new related service provider who needs access to students from two different LEAs in DC. This is a common scenario. So the service provider first needs a SEDS account. And for non-publics, we always grant an aggregate account. Even if they only have students from one LEA at this time, Aussie still sets up an aggregate account because it's possible in the future they will receive students from a second LEA. You as the LEA should never, 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 ever create a SEDS account from scratch for a non-public staff member. Only Aussie should be doing that. Technically, you do have the ability to do that, but you should not do it. You, do, you send them back to Aussie. The non-public SEDS POC knows this. They know if they've been coming to our trainings and listening to our messaging that they're supposed to go to the Aussie support tool to request the aggregate account. Once that aggregate account is put into place, then the non-public SEDS POC reaches out to you directly. Now you go in and you pull up the non-public staff's profile and you modify the profile to set the level of access that is appropriate. So you are the one that goes and looks up the non-public staff member in your user accounts. You should see them there because Aussie has created an account for them. 
And now you modify their profile by checking the box for the school where they work. This means that this allows them to have access to students from your LEA who attend that campus, that non-public campus. Do not check the box for any other school. Do not check the box for your LEA campuses because that opens it up for them to possibly have access to students that they do not serve, and that would not be appropriate. The non-public sets POC is the one that's supposed to be reaching out to you directly to set this level of access. If they reach out to you asking for a SEDS account, you redirect them to Aussie to do step one to get the aggregate account. Then step two is when they come to you asking for you to modify the user profile to give their staff access to specific students. And then from there, of course, you also would set up the caseload or delegate that to your SEC or perhaps a um, supervisor role at the non-public campus to set up the caseload and go from there. And here are steps that you should do to troubleshoot. We still get quite a few tickets in the Aussie support tool where non-public staff cannot access the students that they need to log services for. This is a very common scenario. So we please, please follow these steps to troubleshoot the issue before you reach out to Aussie. These, these six things here are steps that you can do as the LEA SCPOC to troubleshoot and if these if you do these things and it's all good and the issue still persists then it might be something beyond your capacity to resolve then you re then you reach out to Aussie through the Aussie support tool to try to troubleshoot this student's SEDS file and why the non-public staff cannot see them so this is a reminder of the things that you should try before you reach out to Aussie Now, somebody asked a great question here. Somebody asked, how do we find out who the non-public SEDS POC is for a non-public where you have students attending? So I'm typing into the email box here that you would contact. If you do not know, hopefully the non-public has been in touch with you because if you had a student attending your LEA who was then, whose placement was changed to attend the non-public, hopefully there's ongoing communication. If there's not, you should be very worried if you do not know who the person is you're supposed to contact at the non-public to talk about SEDS and talk about issues with the student and to coordinate your LEA being present at the IEP meetings and things like that. So I, um, typing into the chat box, the email address for Dr. Edgar Stewart, he is the Director of Non-Public Monitoring and Compliance here at Aussie. He has a database that lists the non-public SEDS point of contact for every single non-public program where we have students attending. So if you do not know the contact info for the person at the non-public that is the SEDS point of contact, please reach out to Dr. Stewart and he will provide you the name and contact information of the official SEDS point of contact at the non-public program. It's a great question, thank you. Okay, and a reminder about child outcome summary. <laughs> this reminder is for those of you that serve students in preschool or pre-K. If you do not serve students in preschool or pre-K, you can ignore this slide only in today's webinar. So child outcome summary data, as you know, is collected twice a year. A deadline is coming up very quickly in just a few weeks. And hopefully this fall, you have been compiling and collecting that child outcome summary entry data for students who are new to your preschool or pre-K special education program. If you have a student who is in pre-K four and somebody already collected their cost entry data, last year when they were in pre-k-3 that's great you do not need to do it again the entry data is only collected once ideally at the very beginning of when they start a preschool or pre-k special ed program so hopefully that's been done if for some reason you have inherited a student who is now in pre-k-4 and you look in dc cats and you do not see that they have entry data that somebody did last year it is your responsibility 
to go ahead and collect that entry data and put it into DC CATS by the deadline of January 5th. If you have questions, there is the cost FAQ email address at the bottom of the page. That email box is checked by Ms. Carlene Reed, who is the person at Aussie who oversees preschool pre-K special education programming. So she checks that email box. She will get your message if you have any questions about this. And otherwise, please um, be mindful of the deadline. Thank you. And as a reminder, you should be subscribed to the LEA Look Forward newsletter. You are responsible for passing along any information from this newsletter to your staff that might be relevant to them. And we encourage your staff to also be signed up for this newsletter. On this slide, you will see how to sign up. And if you don't want to sign up, or if somehow you missed the email when it came on Wednesday and you can't find it or you deleted it and you still need to see the newsletter, don't worry, all of the newsletters are archived on the Aussie website here. And as a reminder, a lot of you are asked how you can find out about upcoming professional development opportunities. Well, the best way to find out is to read the LEA We Look Forward which always has a section specifically devoted to upcoming professional development events. Things that are newly announced for the first time will always be published in the Look Forward first before they get published anywhere else. We typically open up registration for trainings about six weeks to one month in advance of the training. And we run it for a couple weeks in the newsletter. And then if it's not a new announcement, if it's just a reminder, it might be placed then the next week in the newsletter, you might find it under the dates to remember section. So always take a moment to browse these sections and have your staff browse them to see if there's any relevant trainings coming up that Aussie is hosting that they might be want to sign up for. And restorative practices is a big part of our professional development that we offer this school year. It's a big initiative that's getting a lot of great traction and results in DC. Some of your some of your schools with your LEAs might be involved in very heavy, in-depth, um, on-site coaching and technical assistance for restorative as part of an official cohort. But if not, there are still plenty of opportunities for staff from any school, whether it's a DCPS school or a public charter school, for any staff to get involved and learn more about restorative practices. Upcoming opportunities include the monthly community of practice, in January, there are three specific PD sessions that might be of interest to your staff, a circle keeping workshop, um, a session that spe specifically talks about how restorative practices can apply to younger learners. So that is for staff of a K through six, grades K through six audience. And there is something that applies to both younger and older, the drama and games for social emotional learning is a new training that we're hosting this year that might be of interest. And if you have questions about these trainings, you can contact M. Morrison at, with School Talk. School Talk is our vendor that we, it's a nonprofit that Aussie partners with to help host and run these restorative trainings. All right, now let's get into the good stuff today for the remainder of today's webinar. So for about 20 minutes, we are going to talk about Section 504. Just as a, an overview, an overview, and um, if you want more information, I will share with you resources where you can learn more about Section 504. And I will share information about an upcoming training in January that's a three-hour, half-day training that goes more in-depth about it as well. So Section 504, hopefully you are aware of this. Um, if you are not, I am making you aware not because it's your direct responsibility. That's it may or may not be your direct responsibility. Um, but because it does deal with students with disabilities, which I know that your work touches on, of course. You are the LEA special education point of contact. That does not mean you are also your LEA's Section 504 coordinator, um, but it could be. It's very possible that you wear both hats. You could be the Section 504 person and the special ed person. It just depends on how your LEA is structured and set up. That depends on decisions by your leadership. Um, but somebody in your LEA needs to be overseeing the Section 504 process, which parallels the special ed and IEP process in some ways, but also has some differences, which I will highlight for you. So here is a very high level overview. Section 504 
is part of a set of laws, uh, not from the IDEA, but from the, actually I should probably fast forward to the laws part first, here we go. Section 504 is part of the Rehabilitation Act, which is disability civil rights laws. Section 504 um, specifically can apply to schools because they're receiving federal funding. They are prohibited from discrimination on the basis of disability. So this is not part of IDEA. It's not part of that set of laws. It's part of a different set of laws that's more about civil rights but it does have to do with students with disabilities, which is why we are focusing on it for today. So section 504 applies to students with disabilities. I have here a very rough Venn diagram. Please note this Venn diagram is not all encompassing. There's many nuances and details to the laws that cannot be represented with a simple Venn diagram, but I wanted to provide this visual as a basis for our conversation so you can understand that Students with disabilities, not all of them qualify for special education. Some of them do, and if you do qualify for special education under the eligibility provisions in the IDEA, then you get an IEP, which guarantees that you will get FAPE to help you meet FAPE. A lot of people ask, should a student have an IEP and a Section 504 plan? Is that a thing? The answer is no. If a student has a disability and qualifies for special education, they receive an IEP. You do not need to have a 504 plan if you already have an IEP because the IEP is already comprehensive of anything that a Section 504 plan would include. So having an IEP um, is in fact more comprehensive. It is harder to qualify to, for an IEP. It's a higher bar, more, um, more specific in the disability categories, those 14 disability categories in the law to qualify for special ed, and the IEP covers everything. So you would, should never have a situation where a student has both a 504 and an IEP. It should only be one or the other. Now to have, an IE, to have a 504 plan, you are most likely in this middle circle, a student with a disability who does not qualify for special ed, so you do not qualify for an IEP, but your disability may still rise to the level of you needing to have a services plan in place, a plan that has um, accommodations, modifications, um, in some cases related services. It's all specific to the student. It's all very case by case on an individual basis. So hopefully you can see that the protections of the Section 504 laws apply to both students with disabilities in special ed and those with disabilities not in special ed. It applies to both the purple circle and the middle blue circle. Um, the protections apply, but having an actual 504 plan would only apply to the students in that middle circle because the students in the, in the smaller circle already have an IEP. So hopefully I haven't confused you too much today. And again, this, there's still a lot of nuances that cannot be represented by this diagram. It's not black and white. For a student to qualify for a 504 plan, they have to go through an eligibility process and there's specific laws about what makes a student eligible for a 504 plan. And I will highlight some of those today. <clears throat> Generally speaking, um, FAPE, so it's the same standard of FAPE, for a 504 student versus an IEP student. And for the rest of today's webinar, when I say Section 504 or a student who qualifies for 504, I'm talking about just those students who are not in special ed with an IEP, um, so, so because that's, a, that's separate. So just to clarify. Um, now, for a student to qualify for a 504 plan, they need to have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. So those are key words that we're gonna dig into a little bit deeper. The idea, the, the terminology of having an impairment, a substantial limitation, and major life activity. We're gonna flesh those out a little bit more because it looks a little bit different than what you would see to qualify for an IEP. And here is some language. Some of these slides I'm going to gloss over for the sake of time, but they can be a good reference for you to see some excerpts from the law about Section 504. 
So within your schools, just like there are safeguards and processes in place for special education, there should also be processes in place for Section 504 so that students with disabilities who qualify for 504 are able to receive um, free and appropriate public education. And just like the IDEA, if you're going to determine whether or not a student needs a 504 plan, it has to be made on an individual level. And it also has a spirit of inclusion and non, um, this also can help you not over identify for special ed. Um, in many cases, we've seen where schools try to fit a child into one of the 14 disability categories under IDEA when they truly do not qualify, simply because they recognize that the student needs some type of services. Well, Section 504 might be the more appropriate identification for the student if they do not meet the criteria for IDEA. Um, but 504 is not like your backup plan or your catch-all. You still have to look specifically at whether or not the student meets the requirements of 504, which are very specific. So um, as an LEA, you do need to have processes in place to identify and locate students who may be eligible for Section 504. And just like with IDEA, if a parent requests an evaluation for Section 504, the LEA has to respond and provide those procedural safeguards. So there is a lot about the Section 504 process that is parallel to the special education process. Here are some other provisions. Again, I'm going through this quickly because today is just about giving you a sneak peek and an overview. We do have more in-depth training opportunities coming up soon. You need to have a parallel process in place, just like you do for IDEA, you need to have a process in place for Section 504. Now here's where it gets a little tricky. Um, the state in DC at the state level, so Aussie as a state level agency, we dictate to LEAs for special education that you have to use a certain database. As you know, you all, all LEAs have to use the SEDS Easy IEP database for documenting the, eva the initial evaluation and development of the IEP plan. However, for Section 504, there is not an equivalent database. It is not regulated to that same level at the state level. Rather, it is up to each LEA to come up with their own process and procedures for documenting and moving forward with like referrals and initial evaluations and the creation of the Section 504 plan. Now, with that said, at the end of the webinar, I will show you a toolkit that's been around for a while that has sample forms to kind of give you a jump start if your LEA doesn't already have its own forms and processes in place. And just like with the IDEA, if you're going to evaluate for Section 504, there are safeguards in place where you have to get parental consent, you have to use valid uh, assessments and other measures, the decision for eligibility has to be made upon multiple sources of data, this should all sound very familiar. Again, it parallels the IDEA evaluation process. And in, you must ensure that decisions are made based on the true data and getting input from multiple people, including the uh, child, if they're old enough to give input, and of course the parent, giving them an opportunity to give their input as well. Sometimes people ask about like, well, what about doctors? What about medical tests and information? That's great um, if the the basis upon which they qualify for Section 504 has to do with some kind of um, medic medical diagnosis. That medical diagnosis, that test or data that you get from a medical provider, that can be part of the data considered during the eligibility process. And that's great if you, if you have that. In many cases, you will probably need that to determine that there is a true impairment. Again, it's all very case by case, depending on the individual student. So here are some laws about consent. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it should look familiar to you based on similar safeguards for consent for IDEA. Now we get to eligibility. The law uses certain words where they talk about having a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more major life activities. 
having a record of such impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. So that's some fancy words. Let's break it down a little bit. I like to think of determining eligibility for 504 as a three-part test. Um, so the first step would be to figure out whether or not the student has an actual physical or mental impairment. Um, and if they do, then you, that's, you know, that's check for this one doesn't, if just because you they have an impairment that doesn't does not mean they actually qualify for Section 504. You have to meet all three parts of this test in order to be eligible for a 504 plan. So having the impairment itself does not automatically qualify you. Sometimes a school or a parent will say, but look, I have a doctor's diagnosis that they have this impairment. And that's great that you have data to show that they truly have the impairment, but that is not enough to qualify them for a 504 plan. They need to meet all three parts of this test. That impairment itself needs to cause a substantial limitation on at least one major life activity. So let's dig into that for just a couple minutes. Physical or mental impairment. You could talk for hours about all the different types of impairments that are out there. The laws around this offer some examples and try to categorize the physical impairment to some extent, but this list is not exhaustive. As you know, there can be some really strange or rare disorders or diseases out there that also might be considered a physical impairment. Uh, we just can't, It's not a full laundry list to try to include them in the law. So these are just examples. It could be a neurological, it could be something with their organs, their breathing, their lymphatic system. It could be a mental impairment, not a physical impairment, um, such as an emotional or mental illness. Um, the, the, so the language on this slide comes from some of the laws. This is just an example of things that might qualify as an impairment. I know it can be common for a student that has asthma or that has diabetes or that has ADD or ADHD, those are impairments that often do qualify for a Section 504 plan as long as they meet the other parts of the test. So let's think back. So we talked about impairment, and now number two is substantial limitation, and number three is major life activity. So first, let's talk about major life activity. Um, the law, once again, cannot spell out every single major life activity, but they do give some examples in the law such as eating, sleeping, standing, lifting, bending, reading, concentrating, communicating. So these are examples of a major life activity that the impairment could substantially limit. And again, this is not an exhaustive list, but it gives you an idea of what the types of life activities that this is talking about. So this goes beyond just your like reading, writing, and arithmetic. These are things that might not necessarily be directly affecting their academics, but as a result of, lim of limiting this major life activity, it is affecting their ability to access a free appropriate public education. Substantial limitation. So it's possible that one of these activities is somewhat limited, but not substantially limited. And in that case, they would not qualify for a 504. So if you're going to be truly eligible, you have. You, one of these major life activities has to be substantially limited. And again, this is very subjective language. That's why you have a team of people working together to make the eligibility decision, just like with an IEP. There's a lot of gray area, there's a lot of subjectivity, so you try to follow the law and the process and make sure you have a variety of good data sources to show whether or not there truly is a substantial limitation as a result of the impairment. Now, mitigating measures. So for example, if a student is taking medication for a disorder and the medication is working just fine, um, you cannot say, oh, well, the drugs are working, so they obviously don't need a 504 plan. That's not how it works. Um, when you're thinking about whether or not a student is eligible, um, you cannot consider mitigating measures such as medication, things like that. You just have to think about the impairment itself, and without that medication, would there be a substantial limitation? The only exception here is um, with glasses or contact lenses. You can consider glasses or contact lenses. 
So if glasses or contacts actually fix the problem, then they would not be eligible for 504. So that's the one exception there. Here's a table that I think can be helpful to show a comparison of some similarities and differences between the IDEA for special education and receiving an IEP versus Section 504. So under the IDEA, as you know, there's 14 specific disability categories. Under Section 504, there's not 14 specific things. Rather, there's all different types of physical or mental impairments that may rise to the level of of 504 eligibility. Now, under the IDEA, you're thinking about whether or not a student qualifies for special education, which includes specialized instruction and very often related services. For 504, you're thinking more about accommodations and services in that way, not so much about the specialized instruction. However, with that said, a Section 504 plan can include related services if that is truly what is needed to address the impairment and what it's substantially limiting. Again, that's all in a very case-by-case -case, uh, scenario. If a student needs a lot of related services in a way that it looks suspiciously like an IEP, maybe you should think carefully about whether or not the student truly does qualify for special education. And again, it's all very case-by-case -case on an individualized basis. So at your LEA, so we're wrapping up. We have two minutes left. <laughs> Within your LEA, there should be a Section 504 coordinator. That could be you. It could be your colleague. It could be someone at the central office. It could be a totally separate person. It could be one of your administrators that just is wearing that hat in addition to many other hats. Um, somebody at your LEA needs to be coordinating this, and if you don't know who that person is, please reach out to your leadership and find just for your awareness to know. Um, and you often see a lot of collaboration between the Section 504 coordinator and the LEA special education point of contact because they both deal with that same population of students with disabilities. The difference being whether or not a student qualifies for special ed or if it's a student with a disability who may qualify just for Section 504. You need to have standardized policies and processes in place. Um, to help you with that, there is a Section 504 toolkit that Aussie published about five years ago. Now, it is, I, I don't want to say it's outdated. It's been around for a long time, and it needs to be updated, and Aussie staff is currently working on updating it. But just because we're updating it does not mean that it's outdated. The information in this toolkit is actually still valid and true. The laws have not changed for several years for Section 504. So Aussie is taking a look at what additional types of resources and supports we can provide to LEAs for 504. But in the meantime, this 504 toolkit is a great place to start. And they have forms you can use. In this toolkit, they have actual forms you can download and copy and turn them into your own LEA's forms, like a referral form, an eligibility form, a meeting invitation, a 504 services plan form, a parent brochure to explain to parents what Section 504 is all about. So I encourage you to take a look at these resources. And there is an email address here where you can ask questions, and there's staff at Aussie who will respond to that. And you can sign up for a training. Uh, training is coming up in January. The registration link has not gone live yet. It will most likely be published in next week's LEA Look Forward. But the training will be delivered by Ms. Angela Awanike, who is one of my colleagues in the Division of Teaching and Learning, and she's great. And if you have questions, you can contact her here by email or phone about this upcoming training or about other aspects of Section 504. Thank you for your time today. This concludes the webinar. We are right at 11 o'clock. If we did not get to your questions today, we will reach out to you by follow-up. And as you know, you can expect a follow-up email as well sometime next week with a link to the recording once we get that up on the website. If you have questions about the secondary transition monitoring that I talked about at the beginning of the webinar, here you can see Karen Morgan Donaldson's address on the screen. 
Do you have policy questions, assessment questions, transportation questions, data system questions? All of your points of contact are listed here. And we look forward to seeing you next month at the January session where our main training topic is actually going to be child find and initial evaluation uh, because those are hot topics right now. As you know, the evaluation timeline is about to change from 120 days to a shorter timeline with a different start, uh, a different start time. And child find, there's a lot ongoing with the DL lawsuit for young children in child find. And in addition, there's a lot that for any students of any age that you should be doing for child find. So stay tuned for that, for your topic for January. Thank you for joining today. And I will stay on the line for a few moments to answer questions in the chat box as much as I can. But if you need to log off, feel free to send me an email or send any of these teams an email with your specific questions. Thank you and have a wonderful holiday. I hope you get lots of time off of work, lots of R&R, &R, and we'll see you again in January.